Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Tim Bremner, and I'm the CEO of uh, Faraco International. I'm based in uh, North Bay, Ontario, and I'm very pleased to be able to present to you this afternoon. I'll be going through the investor presentation for, for Faraco. Um, Faraco is a French domicile company uh, based, in, based in France, of course. Um, I'm based here in Canada, and we're uh, listed on the TSX. Uh, there will, this is the normal disclaimer that uh, we're obligated to show you. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about our business. Um, Faraco is a diversified drilling services company serving the mining industry and also the water industry uh, as it relates to mining, but also for water for human consumption, particularly in developing parts of the world. In the, in the drilling services space, we are the number three uh, service provider globally with some 290 rigs. And um, we operate in 22 jurisdictions around the world with uh, 2,300 employees and, as I said, 290 rigs. The, the main focus for our business is, is on the Tier 1 customer groups, as you, as you can see here by the, uh, by the badges. And uh, one remark I'll say about the presentation, because we are a French-based company, all of our, all of our figures are IFRS, uh, so depreciation is included into the, um, into the cost of sales and the margins. And all of, our, all of the figures I'm presenting here are in U.S. dollars. So you can see that uh, Faraco has had some, some impressive growth from 22 to 20, 23, uh, delivering um, reasonable EBITDA margins and, and returns. So just quickly, the jurisdiction, the profile of the company in terms of assets, 290 rigs. Um, 54 of these rigs are, are rotary. These are the highest revenue generating rigs that we have in our fleet. And the ones that are the, have the widest application to all types of drilling in the, in the mining and water services industry. So they're not dependent on any one type of, of work. We have 184 diamond rigs or core rigs that produce a cylindrical rock sample. These are single purpose rigs generally used for mineral exploration. 12 rigs that are combination, meaning they can do one or both of coring and, and um, rotary. And then we have 40 underground rigs. And these rigs are predominantly core rigs, but we also have some drill and blast rigs. Faraco continually invests in, in new equipment. Um, the, the 290 rigs includes 52, 50 new rigs that we've invested in the last five years. Some of that investment has been in diversification, and some of it has been to replace older rigs that are, that are no longer serviceable in the business or don't meet the health and safety regulations that, uh, that the industry demands. The current market value of the equipment is estimated conservatively of 200 million U.S. And uh, a lot of questions we get is uh, how long does a, a, a rig last? Generally, the service life of a rig is somewhere between 15 to 20 years. That doesn't mean it goes out into the field for 15 or 20 years. Uh, we generally do a refit every five years, which means completely updating the rig with newer technology, new engines, new hydraulics, PLC controllers and inspecting the, the frame of the rig, uh, which generally does not get changed. And there you can see the jurisdictions that we work in around the world. We've recently exited some of the unfriendly jurisdictions, including Russia, and uh, have entered the, uh, US, the U.S. market, which is our, our newest jurisdiction. Um, this is one of the most important slides that I have in the deck. Um, and what I'm attempting to illustrate here is the, the life cycle of a mine. If you look on the far left, we're looking at exploration. No mine exists. This is where our customers are out looking for the, for the, for the next mine. They've identified targets in, un, in, in prospective areas, and we would go out and drill holes and, and intersect those targets for, for them, and hopefully there's mineralization. It's the least technical part of the business. The holes are, are generally left to, to go where they want. Um, and it's the, it's the part of the business that is participated in mostly by the juniors. With success, a project will move on to the pre-feasibility and feasibility stage. This is where the highest concentration of drilling occurs uh, at any time in a mine's life. So a customer could have up to 10 to 12 rigs on this particular project, drilling it off, um, you know, proving out the ore body. And this is where uh, technique and skills matter. The holes need to go where they're supposed to. Uh, we're drilling off an ore body. Uh, you know, this has to be uh, uh, something that's going to withstand the rigors of audit. 
and they're, they're drilling to a schedule. This is where the tier one mining companies or the mid-tiers often get involved and become the operators. And this is an area that we specifically target. Why? Because generally the contracts are longer. They run 12 months a year. And it gives us an opportunity to set up a relationship with the, with the customer that is going to lead us into the, the life of mine opportunity, which is to the right, which is where the biggest opportunity uh, occurs. Unlike oil and gas, um, in, a, in an operating mine, drilling is a requirement that is needed throughout the mine's life. If you think of drilling in a producing mine, think of it as an insurance policy. Definition drilling ensures that what they're about to mine is exactly what they expect. Definition drilling is, is low cost insurance for them to make certain that what they put through the mill is what they expect. It also, it, it also gives them a good glance at the structure. Um, if, you, if you don't know there's a bend in the road, you're going to crash your car. It's the same thing in the mining environment. They find a lot of structure that is unexpected and drilling is critically important. Drilling in the producing mine also is sustainable through the metals price cycle where exploration is linked to it 100%. We don't very often see mines close when metal prices fluctuate. So the fluctuation in the drilling demand for an operating mine is, is relatively shallow at about 15% from peak to trough. The other opportunity um, in, the, in the life of mine is that it gives, it gives us the opportunity to deliver the eight different types of services that we provide. Core drilling is the, is, is the one that is used the most, most frequently in exploration, but as you advance further along the, the mine of life, especially when you're underground, you can get into underground exploration, underground definition drilling, underground drill and blast. On surface, you can be doing dewatering work. Uh, you can do infrastructure drilling, and there's a whole host of opportunities that, that come with it, as well as geotechnical work, a lot of geotechnical work done around tailings dams and whatnot. So Faraco is very much focused on, on the right-hand shift of, uh, of the mining life cycle. So when I, when I, when I mentioned to you um, the different types of drilling that we, that we provide, exploration is the one that, that, that people talk about the most. Uh, it's probably the most fun part of the business, uh, especially when, when, the, when the business is good, but it's also the most vulnerable. The industry is very fragmented. Um, you can liken it to the trucking business where there's lots of owner operators. And we find it difficult to differentiate ourselves much more so on price. So uh, unless the market is pretty heated, that's not a big part of our business. The development drilling is something that's, that's, that's much more important. And this is where we do that on the feasibility uh, you can see here, for example, we're taking some particularly large diameter cores uh, on this particular project, which is going to be going through as a bulk sample for a test mill. Then there's the production drilling that we do in an underground environment. Uh, we actually drill, do drill and blast. Um, and this really is getting on infringing on contract mining, but is increasingly an important part of our business. And then linked to all of that, and very, very important, is the water segment. You can appreciate that every miner um, must deal with water, whether it's an open pit or an underground mine. And that means understanding how water is impacted by the mining activity. So monitoring wells continually track the, the groundwater levels, especially in, in arid uh, terrains like in Chile, where it is mandated. So we're doing a lot of monitoring wells for our customers there. Or in wet environment like northern Canada and Labrador, where we drill for Iron Ore Company of Canada in nor northern Labrador or in the Pilbara in Western Australia, where even though it's dry on top, the ore body is saturated. And our job is to move the water temporarily so they can access the ore. And that requires a, a large number of um, very sophisticated and complex dewatering wells. And increasingly, that's becoming a bigger part of our business. So the growth pillars for the company, I mean, exploration is driven by, by the metals price. So I often get asked the question, Tim, how are you going to grow the business in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a market where the metals prices aren't, aren't really um, you know, lighting the world on fire? We're going to do it by focusing on developing our portfolio with Tier 1 customers. They're the ones doing the pre-feasibility work and the life of mine. Um, there's a gap in our portfolio, with, particularly with gold customers, so that is a focus of mine. Those relationships stand uh, long-term. 
when you're at a producing mine, uh, it's really an, an, an evergreen contract and providing you're delivering high quality services at reasonable rates, the job is yours to lose. The um, other area, and these are ranked by the way, is strengthening our position in water services. We see that as a real growth opportunity. Uh, we do a lot of work in Brazil, for example. Uh, we work for Valley, they're our number one customer globally, yet we don't do any work, we don't do any water well work for them, and there is a huge opportunity for us. We're also working in the transition metals. We quite believe that the long-term sustainability of EV transition metals uh, will, will pave the way for us in the future not only copper and nickel, uh, but others as well. And then the last pillar for growth is differentiating through innovation. And this can be sometimes overused, but it is a, an incredibly important pillar in our growth. We've learned that innovation is really our future. Remote controlled rigs are not only safer, but enables us to hire the younger generation, a demographic that don't really get turned on by working out in the rain and the snow, uh, much rather want to work in a controlled environment. So it's also a, a safer way to work. This is a little bit uh, of the financial performance. You can see that uh, we've had, uh, up until the beginning of this year, we had 20 consecutive quarters of, of continuous growth. The first half of this year has, you know, is still, is still quite reasonable. Uh, there has been some softening in the lithium market, which impacted our business a little bit. But the, the biggest driver for the, the, the change in the, in the top line revenue was the decision of the company to exit unsafe jurisdictions that we were operating in. And those unsafe jurisdictions included Russia, which we have now exited completely. And we've taken a number of our assets and moved them across the border into Kazakhstan. Not a great place to start a drilling business, but they're there. And I need to figure out what to do with them. Um, New Caledonia, where we were impacted by the, by the, 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 um, the uh, situation in New Caledonia, where we have an, a number of rigs. Uh, and certain jurisdictions in Africa. Remember, we're a French domicile company, and we must respect the sanctions that the French government puts in place, so we're prohibited from working in Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso. And quite frankly, I wouldn't put anybody to work in that jurisdiction uh, because they are unsafe, and we would have made that decision on our own anyway. And then there was some softening in the, in, the, um, in the lithium business, as I mentioned, which uh, had a slight impact. But the, but the, the underlying margins and EBITDA performance uh, of the company are such that um, we're, we're quite able to, to fund the activities and manage the debt uh, and carry on the business. And when this pivoting is complete, we see the, uh, see the opportunities to grow the business for the reasons that I mentioned. Uh, which include now entering into the U.S. market, which is the only uh, significant safe jurisdiction that Farako has not worked in until now, and that is well underway. So, um, a few actually, I might skip this slide and just go right to the end because it is it is duplicated. So, pardon me for that. So, how do we differentiate ourselves? We are we need to do it through through scope and size. Um, we can't take on these large feasibility projects um, without having the rigs available in the right jurisdictions. Uh, there's significant barriers to entry into the water business, for example, that um, it's, it's anybody can go and buy the rig, but when you look at uh, some of these water wells that we do, about 35% 30 of the work is, is drilling the hole. The rest of it is constructing the well, developing it, installing the pumps, the screens, uh, doing the surface infrastructure. We do this all with the same drill crew. And they're a pretty pretty skilled group of people um, and, not, and not hard to find. Incidentally, the other water services companies, you may think of them that are drilling holes for the city of Vancouver for water supply, well, maybe not Vancouver, um, but, uh, and then the agricultural water drillers, they don't really have an appetite to go and work in the mining industry. They don't want to work remotely. They don't want to work 24 hours a day and they don't want to follow all the safety regulations. So the water industry for, for a mining services uh, company is very much aligned with, with, with what we do. We are also concentrating on specialty projects. Um, specialty projects, specialized operations that might be overused a little bit. But when I mentioned the pre-feasibility drilling um, and being able to uh, 
hit the targets where the customer wants them is critically important. And increasingly, those targets are getting deeper and deeper. If you look at the Sudbury Basin or you look at some of the, the, the gold mines in northern Ontario, they're now <coughs> pardon me, encroaching on 3,000 meters deep. Mining in Canada and, in fact, around the world is going deeper, in part because of EV metals and batteries allowing our, mi our, our customers to mine deeper with remotely powered electric mining equipment, which reduces their manpower and ventilation costs. So they are increasingly going deeper. And this requires a completely different skill set than for exploration. And then we are pioneering innovation. Um, that, too, has been talked about a lot. Innovation sometimes, um, or most often actually, happens in the field. We figure out the drilling challenges while we're there. Um, we've done a lot of work in Canada in the Elk Valley uh, for tech, now Glencore, dealing with the selenium problem that, uh, that is, 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 a, is a problem from the uh, thermal coal, sorry, the uh, Met Coal operations up there. And we're doing a large number of water wells in waste dumps, which is really the drilling from hell, uh, in order for them, them to be able to access the selenium and deal with it. Uh, otherwise, that just ends up in the groundwater in the Fraser and Columbia River, and it's not a very good outcome. And that's estimated at about a $4.5 billion cleanup that uh, those mines have to deal with, and the only way to do it is to get at the water and treat it. And that's taken some pretty innovative drilling techniques, because in the waste dump, you not only have rock, but you've got the old haul truck, you've got the tires, you've got wood, you've got everything that went into the dump, and we have to get through it and get to the bottom to get to the water. Um, so a little bit about innovation. Um, we have been innovating for a number of years. You might have read in the press some of our competitors are, 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 are innovating. Well, we have been too. We pioneered our first uh, remote control rig in Australia um, almost uh, 10 years ago now uh, for Rio Tinto when they mandated that they wanted all of the people moved away from the rig. We weren't hurting anybody, uh, but they said, you know what, we're going to make this remote control so we definitely don't hurt anybody. And it was the right thing to do. And Australia uh, leads our company in innovation, where now almost the entire fleet is remote controlled. Uh, and it has is, it is enabled us to, to not only um, keep our workers safe and put them in a much better controlled environment. It's uh, very hot in Australia, as you know. And it's great to sit in a small, small office uh, running a screen and running the drill, which is you know some 12 meters, 15 meters away from you. And it's also allowed the younger generation, including ladies, to, to join our company um, with great success, uh, where we now have about 25% of our field workforce in Australia is, is women, including some of the best drillers in, in, in the fleet. So innovation is, is definitely something that uh, is part of our, part of our mandate. Um, directional drilling and being able to, to take the holes exactly where they are supposed to go that used to be something that was a third-party service that, provided, uh, that was provided to us by our customer. We now have that capability fully in-house, and uh, that de-risks the, the project for our customer. I better speed up here. Um, so just the, the revenue exposure, as I mentioned, we work mainly for the, for the majors. You can see here that the revenue split is 85% for the Tier 1. The geographies that we, we work in are predominantly uh, North America, we are the single largest services provider in Canada, ahead of major drilling. Um, and Australia, Latin America at 32%, and the rest of the world at, at 12 Heavy exposure in EV metals, running at about 51%. 2% of that is lithium, and the remainder is nickel and copper um, equally. And I remind everybody that not all nickel is EV nickel. Uh, the lateritic nickel is not. It's only good for the saucepans and stainless steel. Uh, so the, the battery nickel that we focus on is coming from our customers, uh, such as Valley um, and uh, McEwen and Glencore. Um, Long-term relationships are extremely important. Um, mining services and the whole mining industry is a relationship business. When I first joined the company 18 years ago, the owners of the business didn't understand it. They came from the oil and gas business. They wanted to you know, challenge every single contract that we had and look at the T and C's. And I said, gentlemen, this business is built on trust and relationships. And the sooner we understand that equation and deliver what the customer wants, the better off we'll be. 
Um, when I started the company in Canada 18 years ago, we worked for Falcon Bridge, then Extrata, and we still today work for Glencore 18 years later without a tender. So that is a testament to how important these relationships are. Because we're French domicile, we're also mandated to report um, on, on the, um, oh, pardon me, that's the wrong slide. Um, we're poised to, uh, to take on the most dynamic commodities. We still believe in the energy transition metals as the ones that are going to drive our business going forward. We're seeing that uptick in Argentina, where copper is, is coming on stream, Brazil and Chile, and also in the U.S. Water management is going to be huge uh, going forward uh, as we grow our business. And as I mentioned, we're underweighted in gold, but that's also a very important commodity for us for the reasons stated earlier, that there's lots of opportunities for, for um, producing mines, particularly in the U.S., where you can enter long-term contracts. Rig utilization is uh, a little bit off from last year at 40%. Uh, when you have a look at this deck, which we can send to you, you can look at the effect on the revenue when we increase the utilization rate back up to 50, 60% where it was. Maximum utilization rate runs at about 74%. Nobody can, can, can do much better than that because rigs need to be maintained and moved. So the top line can grow significantly as, as well as the earnings with an improved utilization rate. That will come up as we finish our, our uh, movements of rigs around the world and reposition ourselves in the, um, in the better jurisdictions. A little bit about the balance sheet. Um, <clears throat> Faraco uh, incurred a lot of debt um, about 10 years ago as a result of M&As done in, in, a, in a much different market um, and incurred uh, several uh, refinancing restructurings. Um, we have managed to return to normalized commercial banking relationships as of November last year, and we are now um, focused on deleveraging the balance sheet and have the debt now down to a much more manageable level of, 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 uh, with a... With a with a uh, leverage ratio of about 0.92, and uh, my mandate is to continue to manage that down to around 0.5. The go-forward capital allocation plan is simple. <clears throat> we will maintain at all times a minimum 30 million uh, U.S. in cash uh, to mitigate against anything unexpected forces or challenges that we may see come upon us. Um, we will keep our gross debt uh, equal to or less than uh, our EBITDA, so always have a leverage ratio of less than one. Uh, I'd like to see even less than that. And we'll use our free cash to service our debt as required and pay down more debt if available. And then we would distribute free cash to shareholders up to 3% through a, um, through a dividend, um, uh, up to 3% of market cap. I get a lot of questions about, uh, about an NCIB. We have an NCIB which is in place now that funds our free share plans. And um, I've only got three minutes left. So one of the things I want to point out is the value proposition for, for Faraco. We are, we are undervalued compared to our peers. Uh, as you can see here, there was one uh, transaction which occurred in April when Bortlongia was taken private, and you can see the multiples here. Uh, the EBITDA enterprise value multiple of 6.5 uh, compared to us at 3.4. So the upside for us... Um, is somewhere between 550 and 650 if you apply these, these multiples. Uh, ESG focus, as I say, we are mandated to report that. So why invest in Faraco? We're a global market leader with a differentiated focus, especially on drilling solutions and pioneering pri prior, um, proprietary innovations. We're well diversified with our revenue exposure. We're not overly dominant in one, in fact, a little underweighted in gold, and that's quite balanced. We're in the key commodity markets, um, and those markets right now, especially copper, are experiencing good tailwinds in the, in the macro um, e economy. Uh, the go-forward strategy is focused on increasing the, the utilization of our rigs as opposed to investing in new uh, for high growth markets. So we're going to be deploying more rigs to the U.S. We're starting a rotary business in Brazil that won't require new capital. Uh, we're going to increase our capital market activity. I need to get out on the, sh the, on the road a, a little bit more and tell the story. And last but not least, the reason is the highly experienced management team at Faraco, uh, of which most of us have uh, in excess of 40 years and understand the business intimately. I think that is about it. I don't know if we have time for any questions.
One minute left. I'm sorry if I rushed. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time and attention, everybody. It was a pleasure to present to you. Thank <clears throat> you.